auditor's liability, we did Lex, Lex, Moore, and Kiss. So number two, we look at civil liability under the law of contract. Civil liability under the law of contract. Remember how we started this topic? We started by indicating the persons to whom the auditor is answerable to. The persons to whom the auditor is answerable to. Number one was the government, hence we did criminal liabilities. Now we are doing a civil liability and a lot of contract where we say that the auditor is answerable to the shareholders or basically we talk of to the clients. Now, what must the clients or the shareholders satisfy if they are to be successful in seeking uh, justice uh, where the auditor has breached the contract? So we started by discussing the clients must be able to satisfy that. We list these points now, very important points. Number one, that a contract, that a contract existed. Number two, that the auditor breached the contract, auditor breached the contract, i.e. the auditor was negligent. So there was a contract. Number two, the auditor breached the contract. Roman number three, the client suffered loss. Roman number four, the loss suffered. can be quantified into monetary terms, into monetary terms. And lastly, number five, the rose suffered can be directly attributed, can be directly attributed To negligence on the part of the auditor. Yes, we are saying for this issue to be permissible in a court of law or to hold water, the client must be able to indicate number one, there was a contract. That's why later along we'll be discussing uh, is a number two term. Discussing engagement rate. Discussing engagement rate. What is engagement rate? This is the contract. Is the contract between the auditor and the client. The auditor drafts an engagement rate to indicate acceptance of the engagement. So to be able to indicate that a contract existed, the client should be able to produce an engagement rate. Number two, that the auditor breached the contract. We are, if these are a unique statement where we are discussing contract and tort in the same statement, uh, because the uh, client should be able to indicate that the auditor breached the contract. We are able to confirm this if we can indicate that the auditor was negligent. What is negligence? Negligence will arise if the auditor does what a professional accountant should not do or fails to do what a professional accountant should do, that is negligence. Then the client must be able to indicate that they suffered loss, and then the loss can be quantified into one of the terms, how much is the loss. And the loss suffered can be directly attributed to negligence on the part of the auditor. But if it were not for negligence on the part of the auditor, the client would not have suffered loss. We will discuss a case of random or 
storage company, 1904. Randon Oil Storage Company of 1904. Randon Oil Storage Company of 1904. Randon Oil Storage Company of 1904. Brandon Oil Storage Company of of nineteen oh four. So how to happen in, in this case? Eh, before we write during the audit exercise, the auditor heavily relied on the Peter Cashier's records. Heavily relied on the Peter Cashier's records, which indicated that. There was 786 pounds in the cash till. There was 786 pounds in the uh, in the cash box. The officer did not verify. He uh, concurred with the petty cashier without even verification. Later it was realized that there was only 30 pounds in the cash till. All the other amounts had been embezzled, but the officer was not able to detect this because he did not verify himself. He was seen to be negligent. How did the uh, House of Rhodes, House of Rhodes argue them? They indicated that 786 pounds was such a high value. This is 1904, 786 pounds. But this figure was so high that ought to have put the auditor upon inquiry. It's so huge that it ought to have put the auditor upon inquiry. Upon inquiry, meaning that he ought to have verified, which he never did. And that's why I first defined negligence, that it relates to doing what one should not do, or failing to do what one should do as a professional accountant. So any other accountant, this figure ought to have put him upon inquiry, which did not happen with regards to this case of random oil storage company of 1904. So the auditor was proved to be negligent. It's a very sensitive aspect because it's number 530 uh, discusses a uh, sampling. If there is one element you cannot sample is cash. Cash you always verify everything. The, the much sampling is done with regard to Cash needed to not verify bank balances for bank, for bank or even central bank, you may find them sampling, though they practice what we call professional skepticism. Professional skepticism. They don't just sample. What they do, they know how much notes or how many notes are in a bado and how many bados are in a box. So what we'll do, they will sample like two bundles and count whether they have the uh, expected notes. Then they conclude it's complete. And again, it's influenced by the frequency uh, frequency that they are able to detect inconsistencies. So have you detected some inconsistencies, inconsistencies in the past? So if so, you increase the sample size. But holding all the factors constant, cash should not be sampled. You count sharing after the other. We call it you count on coin basis, like we analyze that in a payroll and others on coin basis. So what do you say in this case? Uh, during the audit exercise, during the audit exercise, the auditor placed placed reliance, the auditor placed reliance on the petty cashier's records, the petty cashier's records, which indicated that, which indicated that there was Seven eight six pounds in the cash tier. In the cash tier, the auditor 
did not carry out. Did not carry out physical verification of the petty cash balance of the petty cash balance. <laughs> Later, it was realized that there was such funds only in the cash tier. All the other amounts, all the other amounts had been embezzled. Later, it was realized that there was that pounds only in the cash till. The other amounts had been embezzled. The House of Lords ruled that the auditor was negligent. for not verifying the pet cash since the amount was so huge that it box to put him on inquiry. Perfect. That's how the case was ruled. So during the audit exercise, the auditor placed reliance on the petty cashier's records, which indicated that there were 786 pounds in the cash tier. The auditor did not carry out physical verification of the petty cash balance. Later, it was realized that there was only that pounds uh, in the cash tier. All the other amounts had been embezzled. The House of Rods ruled that the auditor was negligent. The auditor uh, was negligent for not verifying the, the, the petty cash since the amount was so huge that it ought to have put the auditor upon inquiry. To have put him upon inquiry. So negligence failing to do what a professional accountant should do or doing what a professional accountant should not do. That's negligence. All right, now Rizokana, are we supposed to know the cases or they are just used as examples? So at this level, the examiner quotes the case. In the few uh, questions I've seen, the auditor of the examiner indicates in the case of head rebellion versus seller and partners, then proceeds say that auditors may be held liable if a third party uh, if a third party is aggrieved for any reason. Then you're supposed to indicate what a third party must satisfy. So I've not seen a case asking us to highlight the facts of the case. But you see, you need to know to be able to handle a question on auditor's liability. But when you move at advanced level, the auditor does not ask for the case, but you must quote it the way we've done it on the whiteboard. So the examiner will not ask, it will only indicate that auditors have got responsibilities to the client and the other parties. Discuss 10 marks. So you can't earn 10 marks without a case study. So here, you just need to have a vast understanding of the auditor's liability. So they phrase it in any way, you can reason out, you can navigate and able to handle it. So Sijaona Swari now is a quote the case. They always quote it for us when they ask us uh, a question relating to it. That, that was one. Yes, sleep somewhere like around. All right. I'm raising the question. 
we can move to civil liability under the rule of tort. All right, civil liability under the rule of tort. Yes, now na kuna waishimu wa mengia leo for the first time. Sasa wenye tumekuweko na taka tuonyeshe wenye wa mengia leo kwa mba kuna kufitu tumesona wewe kama hawa yuko and they need to catch up. We discussed six points on evolution of audit. But in our notes, I refer to them as don't make reference. Don't make reference. It's okay to keep them or you have to check, but we need to try first. In our notes, we listed them as Changes in audit objectives. We discussed six points. What can you recall? I remember somebody said I do in English the whole session. Which of these changes in audit objectives can you recall? You can have one person remembering this. If we have newcomers today, they may feel that they've not lost so much. <laughs> if those who have been in class <laughs> cannot recall, then there's no so much to catch up on. Yes, at least one. You see? Yes, that's what he's learned. Yes, so the newcomers you have several things to catch up on because that's very correct. That uh, our audit was manual audit, whereas contemporary audit, clients have computerized their accounting systems. So as auditors, we have no option. We need to do computerized audit. And that's why I mentioned the element of that computerized aided audit techniques. Perfect. Another, uh -huh, I'm coming to you. The early audit was based on coaching, uh -huh. while uh, the current uh, rest of the system controls. Uh, I like that point. You've done it so well. But our audit was watching audit. But in contemporary audit, we have a normal than audit approach. System-based and risk-based audit approach. System-based and risk-based audit. I, not, I hope he has not said what you wanted to say. Mm -hmm. This is very correct. This is very correct. In our audit, the primary objective was to prevent, detect, and correct errors and frauds. For in contemporary audit, this is just an incidental objective. So then, it's a 240. Errors, frauds, irregularities are primary objective. Currently, it's just an incidental objective. So I'm right when I'm referring here with my running friends. These points are coming. Another point? Ah, the one I want you to recall, you have to recall. The one I want to connect with this subtopic. But you've tried. At least recording three out of six. We are somewhere halfway. You can recall another one? That's the point I'm looking for so that we can connect it here. Yes, thanks for that. Very correct. That are audits. Auditors were reporting to owners, but in contemporary audit, auditors have extended reliability. And that's why I mentioned even that parties who are not privy to this contract, they are not privy to this contract. You know the general rule that if you're not a part of your contract, you can never purport to have either some rights or some obligations from it because you're not privy to it. But this is an exceptional case that even the parties who are not privy to this contract can successively seek redress if they suffer quantifiable financial loss at some point. Excellent, those are four points out of six. So the other one that we might be forgetting, eh? or somebody has recalled this, that in our audit, auditors were reporting on truth and correctness. 
Remember, we captured that under disadvantage of an audit. The last disadvantage is that we are trying to listen down. Uh, and the inherent limitations of an audit or reasons why we can't give an absolute assurance. We listed, uh, we listed um, several points there that in an audit, auditors were reporting on truth and correctness, but in contemporary audit, they only report, they only form the opinion guided by the process to impair. Then the last one. In contemporary audit, we have the stewardship concept and corporate governance aspects, which were not there in audit. Audit, ah, to make a condition now, we are good to go. The one we've been given there by Abi, we are, we, are, we are saying that auditors were answerable to owners, but in contemporary audit, they have extended liability. Mm -hmm. That's what you're discussing here. That's what you're discussing here. Actually, we'll start by saying in early auditing, in early auditing, comma, auditors were only answerable to owners. Were only answerable. Bonus for stop. There was no way that reliability would have accrued with regard to bad parties. Since they are not privy to the contract, no way that liability would have accrued with regard to that practice. Since they are not privy to the contract, they are not privy uh, to the contract. They were not privy. Contracts. I want us to discuss two cases. One is referred to as Alpha Maya. Alpha Maya versus Living Touch. Don't write it first. Let me explain then. This one I'll dictate. This one I'll dictate so that we get the fact right. Mm -hmm. Now, the arrangement of these two persons this is the plaintiff, this is the defendant. Plaintiff, defendant. The alpha now, this was a banker. This was an auditor or auditing firm. Then we had a leather company. Leather company here. What happened? The auditors mm -hmm. went out, certified, certified the bishop belonging to the leather company and gave it a clean bill of health that it portrayed a true and fair view. Then the banker relying on this relying on this subtle visit granted a loan to the other company. And the subtle visit formed the basis of granting the loan. Later, the other company defaulted, defaulted in loan repayment. And Alpha Miles agreed. He is seeking legal redress. He is suing me went out. For negligence. The House of Lords then ruled in favor of auditors by indicating that there was no professional relationship between the auditor and the banker. There was no proximate relationship between the auditor and the banker. Hence, there was no way that liability would have accrued. Alpha Meyer lost the case. Your statement to Mishika Mizuri. Oh, Kwamba, this was in our audit where. Auditors were only answerable to owners. So in that party, who tried to seek legal redress after suffering financial loss may be upon relying on the auditor's professionalism would not succeed. But this decision was reversed in 1963 in the case of Headley, Headley Bairn versus Hera and Partners. Of 1963, you can recall the overruling precedents by previous previous presidencies overturned. 
So what happened in this case, the House of Lords realized that the decision made in the Ultramare case was not okay. That the party should, should, uh, should be successful if they're able to prove they suffered loss upon the on one's professionalism. So again, this is the plaintiff, this is the defendant. Both of them were bankers. This was a banker, uh, this was a banker. Then we had a client by the name Essie Power. Essie Power was banking with her and partners. and partners. But when he needed some loan, he approached Henry Baron for loan. In current due diligence exercise, Henry Baron approached her and partners for a reference letter. Reference letter about creditworthiness of Essie Power. Her and partners granted a reference letter to head rebel, indicating that AC power was credit one. But they went further to introduce a disclaimer. Her and partners indicated that they will not accept any liability that may arise as a result. Nikama unilize, unataka kupatia rafiki yangu hapa pesa fulani, na muweza client, nikama nakuwana na unajuana na huye rafiki. And I will the peso. Nimpatia may ta kuwa jimini kwambie. As much as I know her, she is credit one. Like in a sporodisha, Sami Haposi. That's a disclaimer. Disclaimer that extinguishes you from liability. Yes, it, it shields you from any liability that may arise. Later, as far defaulted in non repayment, and now had the bearing are agreed. They are suing her and partners for recklessness in the issuance of the reference letter. Then the House of Lords ruled that her and partners would have been held square liable for negligence if it were not for the disclaimer. So that the disclaimer protected them. If it were not for the disclaimer, they would have been held squarely liable for negligence. So there's no auditor here, but the general rule that if one relied on one's professionalism and suffered quantifiable financials, they can successfully seek legal redress. There is also another case you learned in lower level, uh, although we will not write it here. I'm just reinforcing what I've just explained here. I remember I had mentioned this sometimes, Mark. Donogi versus Stevenson. Of 1932, believe so, 1932, yes. Where a guy took his girlfriend for an outing, they were taking drinks from the book doctors. What did we say about the case? Yes, that when the lady was almost done with her drinks, with her drink rather, she noticed remains of a decomposing snail. Yes, they sued the manufacturer of this product and they were successful. What was the general rule? That a customer, a consumer of a product can successfully seek legal redress if they are agreed in one or another. Or else, a producer, a producer, or a manufacturer, for that matter, owes a little of care to the general public. And so is the editor, owes a little of care to the general public. So you suffer us. You can successfully seek the reward request. So we are compensated. They are compensated uh, uh, for tracing foreign materials in their product, in their drink, in their drink. Any question? So, see, you understand your story. Can you understand what I'm asking? Shall I be on my command to take? All right, I think I can explain something else before you write in your 20 k story to once. 20 k story once. To share a reserve, to share a reserve, what a client must satisfy if they are to be successful in civil liability and the law of contract. What about a bad party? Bad party, what must be satisfied for them to be successful in such a case? Number one, you must be able to indicate that auditor hold them a detour of care 
recall what you mentioned about the civil liability and the rough contract, that there was a contract. Here we are talking of detail of care. Number two, in the client aspect, we say client must be able to indicate that the auditor breached the contract. Here we are talking of breaching the detail of care. So auditor breached the duty of care, though we still indicate that the auditor was negligent. The auditor was negligent. Number three, the third party. The third party suffered loss. Third party suffered loss. Number four, the loss suffered is quantifiable into monetary terms. There's some statements used to cover in law. I don't know whether they relate to this. What was the injurious and doom and doom was an injury? You can recall them, but maybe you may have forgotten what they mean. Or the leavings, I'm sure they are not new to it. But for those who did master's in law, master's in law, <laughs> <laughs> yes. master's in law, no longer you, you do things everywhere. <laughs> in Jewish and Greek law, what was this now? In Jewish, you write what? Yeah, can't recall. Without, oh, without intent, without damage, it's it, an element of damage was there. So implicit for us, injurious and injurious without damage. Then the other one, injurious and injurious, damage without injury. Uh, there's one that connects with this. I think I need to reason about it when or seated as the University of Kriwada. So we say there must be quantified bills in monetary terms, in monetary terms. Uh, to then number five, just like in the contract, uh, there was suffered, there was suffered can be directly attributed. Attributed to negligence, negligence on the part of the auditor, on the part of the auditor. Then we add some more points. Number six, the auditor, the auditor mean the intended use, use of the report, of the report, and most importantly, the auditor did not introduce a disclaimer. Otherwise, if there's a disclaimer, we've seen what it can do. If there's a disclaimer, we've seen what it can do. We've seen what it can do. I want to dictate summarized version of those three cases, two cases rather, so that you can have it uh, Yes, somebody is saying what I'm, what I'm teaching is different from what is in the case. You know, it's, it's not different. It's a different version. Okay, so that when you read the PDF, you read what I'm giving you, ah, you will be spoiled of points. The examiner is asking for four, you have 12. Yes, otherwise, if I dictated what is in the PDF, that's duplication. That's duplication. Uh, we need to avoid uh, uh, duplication. All right. So in the case, we just written this. This was the introductory bit. Then you're saying, in the case of Ultra Mile versus Niven Tau Chop 19, that's two. In the case of Ultra Mile versus Niven Tau In the case of Ultra Mile versus Niven Tau of 19, that's two. Niven Tau of 19.2, you went out of 19.2, it was held that 
it was held that it was held that the auditor has no legal relationship. The auditor has no legal relationship. The auditor has no legal relationship in absence of contractual relationship. The auditor has no legal relationship in absence of contractual relationship, in absence of contractual relationship. Very important to note that another paragraph say, in this case, in this case, in this case, the banker advanced a loan. In this case, the banker advanced a loan to another company. In this case, the banker advanced a loan to another company on the strength of a balance sheet, advanced a loan to another company on the strength of a balance sheet signed by the auditors, on the strength of a balance sheet signed by the auditors, which in essence is signed by the auditors, which in essence was the ground for granting the loan which in essence was the ground for granting the loan, which in essence was the ground for granting the loan, which in essence was the ground for granting the loan. Full stop. Another paragraph say, the balance sheet later proved to be fraudulent. The balance sheet later proved to be fraudulent. The balance sheet later proved to be fraudulent and misleading. The balance sheet later proved to be fraudulent and misleading. Later proved to be fraudulent and misleading. Fourth term. It was decided that it was decided that it was decided that. There was no chance of any liability arising. There was no chance of any liability arising. There was no chance of any liability arising. No chance of any liability arising as there had no contractual relationship. No chance of any liability arising is there had no contractual relationship between the auditors and the bankers. No contractual relationship between the auditors and the bankers. No contractual relationship between the auditors and the bankers. Between the auditors and the bankers. So that is in early auditing. That is in early auditing. Skip around and say, in Hedry Bourne versus Hare and Partners. In Hedry Bourne versus Hare and Partners, 1963. In Hedry Bourne versus Hare and Partners, 1963. Hare and Partners, 1963. Hare and Partners, 1963. The House of Rhodes, you're calling them the House of Rhodes. The House of Rhodes, the House of Rhodes decided that the Ultra Mayor's case, the House of Rhodes decided that the Ultra Mayor's case, the Ultra Mayor's case was wrongly decided. Decided that the Ultra Mayor's case was wrongly decided. The Ultra Mayor's case was wrongly decided and that professional negligence can arise and that professional negligence can arise and that professional negligence can arise professional negligence can arise if a financial loss is suffered professional negligence can arise 
if a financial loss is suffered by third parties, if a financial loss is suffered by third parties, who rely on professional skills suffered by third parties? Who rely on professional skills and the judgment of persons who rely on professional skills and judgments of persons with whom professional skills and judgments of persons with whom they have no contractual relationships. Judgments of persons with whom they have no contractual relationships, with whom they have no contractual relationships. So basically reversing the decision made uh, in 19 that two, first another paragraph. In this case, in this case, in this case, before entering into the transaction, before entering into the transaction with a power company, before entering into the transaction with the AC Power Company, before entering into the transaction with the AC Power Company, the plaintiff sought reference. The plaintiff sought S O U G H T. The plaintiff sought reference. The plaintiff sought reference of the company's financial position. The plaintiff sought reference of the company's financial position from the anchors. Sought reference of the company's financial position from the bankers into brackets defendants. Company's financial position from the bankers into brackets Defendants into brackets, defendants. First of all, the banker gave reference. The banker gave reference. The banker gave a reference, but stated that the banker gave reference, but stated that they accepted no liability. Stated that. They accepted no liability stroke responsibility. They accepted no liability stroke responsibility for accuracy of that reference. Accepted no liability stroke responsibility for accuracy of that reference. For accuracy of that reference, for accuracy of that reference. Later we'll discuss the screen at length. There's a question for the first time, it was tested at intermediate level. Then after two sittings, they got tested it to advanced levels. And they were asking, what implications will the screen have in the auditor's opinion if the auditor issued a clean report and introduced a disclaimer? I've audited your accounts. I'm saying that the books of accounts portrays a true and fair view. Then I'm introducing a disclaimer, distancing myself from any liability that may arise. Is that even an audit? It's 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 lacking meaning because why audit? We are auditing so that number one, we enhance the confidence of the intended users. But I'm telling you, they are fine. But if you suffer any loss, I'm not there. Have I really enhanced your confidence? No. It is intended to enhance the credibility, credibility of the financial statements, which will not be achieved if we introduce a disclaimer. It is intended to reduce information risk, information risk, which has not been achieved. So that was question number five. The first question, I can't recall which sitting. I need to confirm this. They were asking us. 
what are the limitations if an auditor introduced a disclaimer upon issuing an qualified opinion, which is a clean report? What happens is this affects the quality of evidence, affects the quality of audit rather, affects the quality of audit. We've just indicated audit lacks meaning when a disclaimer is introduced. It's not achieving its intended objectives. It affects negatively, affecting negatively the point, affects negatively the quality of opinion. The quality of opinion. Roman number three, it may form the basis, which is an ethical. It may form the basis of charging audit fee. You know what happens when you go to buy things from um, Hindi? Sometimes they will ask us during the receipt. If you want a receipt, it's this much. ETR receipt. If you don't need an ETR receipt, then this is the much you're paying. So you can imagine in auditing exercise, we get to that extent. But if I'm introducing a, if you're introducing a disclaimer, then I can't pay you that much. You want to negotiate downwards because the opinion won't have been affected negatively. If you're not introducing a disclaimer, then we, we, we are likely to pay much higher amount. So these are the effects of introducing a disclaimer in the auditor's opinion, because we are reducing auditing to some other things which do not qualify as an audit. These were the answers to earn you six marks, to earn you six marks. So I've said it will affect the quality of audit, affect the quality of audit opinion, and unethical, it may form the basis of charging audit fees. Unethical, it may form the basis of charging audit fees because you have other factors to consider uh, or to influence and how much audit fee to charge, but not this. This is unethical. This is uh, unethical. I like keeping checking what the online family is saying. It's Naomi Remuya. He's saying, uh, I've just taken them once more. That upon introducing disclaimer, we are affecting negatively the quality of audit. We are affecting negatively the quality of the audit opinion. And an auditory, we make this to form the basis of charging the audit fee. Because you cannot charge so much for you only to introduce a disclaimer in your opinion. Perfect. That was just a bit of dictum. That was just a bit of dictum. So in our notes, we are saying uh, of that reference responsibility, of that reference. Another paragraph said, the reference later proved misreading. The reference, the reference, Later proved misreading, the reference, later proved misreading, and the bankers were found to be negligent. The reference, later proved misreading, and the bankers were found to be negligent. And the bankers were found to be negligent. And the bankers were found to be negligent. First of in the ruling, in the ruling, in the ruling, the House of Lords held that. In the ruling, the House of Lords held that the bankers had been negligent. In the ruling, the House of Lords held that the bankers had been negligent. In the ruling, the House of Lords held that. The bankers had been negligent, but the disclaimer protected them. But the disclaimer protected them. But the disclaimer protected them. And therefore, they could not be held liable. 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 They could not be held liable. A question, why would it form a basis of charging audit fees? Yes, the letter of engagement has been signed or they shall alter it. What happens? All these deliberations happen prior, prior to signing the engagement letter. 
or we've not yet covered this. When we're discussing ISA 210, ISA 210 discusses engagement filter. We will discuss the purpose. What's the purpose of what's one of the purpose amongst the seven of engagement filter? It defines the basis of charging audit fees. So the element of audit fees will come well before we commence on what we will inquire from the auditor. How do you do your opinion? Do you introduce a disclaimer or not? So it's coming way before we commence audit at the uh, engagement signing stage. It's a good question. So it comes way before we commence audit. Skip along and say, for that party to succeed, 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 then they must satisfy that. Then they must satisfy that. For that party to succeed, then they must satisfy that. All right, list down these seven points. All the organ editor of care was breached, suffered loss. List them down very fast. List them very fast. As I top up some ink. Now we've seen that auditors are operating in highly litigious environment. When you talk of highly litigious environment, it means that right web center auditor can always be sued, can be taken to court. That party, even who are not privy to a contract, can still sue them. So, what we need to do to minimize auditors' liabilities. So, subtopic ways of minimizing auditors' liability. Ways of minimizing auditors' liabilities. What do you need to do to minimize auditors' liability? We've already seen one here, number seven. Introduce this claim. Introduce this claim. In the report. So that alone is a way of minimizing auditors' liabilities. Number two, avoid being negligent. Avoid being negligent by observing quality controls. Quality controls. This is another topic we discuss later. Quality controls. This is discussed under ISA number, ISA number 220 or ISQC number one, internal standards of quality control. What do we need to do as auditors to ensure we perform quality audit? A very small topic, but very, very important. So we avoid being negligent. Number three, um, compliance. Compliance to the relevant. Profession, professional and legal guidelines. You know, when you perform audit guided by ISA, you adhere to ISA from uh, initial stage to the end. It's just like being compliant to constitution. If, even if somebody charged to what you are doing, we have the basis of argument because there is total compliance. But if there's no compliance, you're likely to find yourself in trouble. Number four, indicate clearly. Indicate clearly. Work done, comma, work not done, and any limitation. Any limitation in scope. Indicate clearly work done work not done, and any limitation in scope. Indicate clearly work done, work not done, and any limitation in scope. What we mean, when you're writing an auditor's report, paragraph number, paragraph number four, paragraph number four, where we do the introduction, we always start by saying, we 
audited books of accounts of KC Limited. Actually, we don't indicate books, so we highlight which books. We audited the balance sheet, the income statement, the cash flow statement of KC Limited. That's indicating clear work done. So that any intended user would know it's an auditor's report because we audited. Work not done, especially when you are performing non-assurance engagements, non-assurance engagements, we say, we never audited, neither reviewed. We want to be very clear because no one will come out saying, I relied on the auditor's report and such address. We have indicated that we never audited. This is not an auditor's report. So no one may purport to use it as such. Limitations and scope to recover it under the um, auditor's, auditor's report. What is limitations and scope? This is when you're not able to gather evidence for some reasons. You were not able to access some evidences which you consider necessary for the purpose of this audit. Maybe the management was hostile. You never accept some evidence. Maybe the books of accounts had been destroyed by fire or fraud, like uh, what was happening elsewhere. So this way, so if the books of accounts have been destroyed by fire or fraud, management have been hostile, this amounts to limitations on scope. So you have to indicate that you are not able to gather all the evidence which you had considered necessary for the purpose of audit. Number five, number five, a screening of the client. Screening of the client before taking up the engagement, <laughs> before taking up the engagement, before taking up the engagement. Yes, understand who, understand who is this client. Understand the client in and out. Because there is what we'll be calling later under ESA number 315, uh, engagement risk. Risk which arises as a result of engagement with the client. But if it were not for this client, I will not have found myself in the courts of law. If it were not for this client, that engagement risk, the most you find yourself in is a result of taking up an engagement with a certain client. You take up a client then only to realize they are involved in money rather than activities. You find yourself in that mix as their audit. Number six, <laughs> we're withdrawing. We're withdrawing from engagements where reliability is likely to arise. So you are screening to avoid engaging with the client where liability may arise. But if this comes to your attention when you have already taken up the engagement, then you have, you have an option to withdraw, disengage. Disengage from undertaking where liabilities are likely to arise. <clears throat> Number seven, organize. Organize for seminars. Workshops and trainings for audit staff, for audit staff. Yeah, we want to equip them with the necessary skills, necessary skills so that they're able to perform quality audits. Nothing keeps on changing. You hear we are moving from IFRS, this one to this other one, IAS to certain IFRS. So trainings and workshops are very important to be up to date with the current trends in accounting and auditing. Number eight, indicating clearly, indicating clearly in the engagement rater, in the engagement rater, and in the auditor's report. Auditor's report on the intended users. On intended users of the report. Who do you intend to use this report? Indicating clearly in the engagement rate and in the auditor's report on the intended users of the report. Who are the intended users? 
Otherwise, any other person who uses this report and they were not the intended users, they will do so at their own peril. If you can call using this statement, they'll do so at their own peril, at their own risk. Sometimes you call it warrant and fit. Warrant and fit injuria. Warrant and fit injuria. Yes, warrant none fit injuria. This is voluntary assumption of risk. You know you're not the intended user, and then you go ahead to use the report. It is at your own. You come to choose me up and then a message and then a picture. Do you come a message in the same that you know? Because can I preach? Zaga and Ashika Sumiako and at your own risk, at the warrant and fit in jail, it's voluntary assumption of risk because they are not being intended uses when they go ahead to make reference or to check at their own risk. Last number nine, we can say, um, pick up. Take up an identity cover. Take up an indemnity cover. Indemnity cover with an insurance company. Take up an indemnity cover. <laughs> Take up an indemnity cover with an insurance company. Indemnity cover with an insurance company. Yeah, we know what we mean by indemnity. We mentioned this when we were discussing rights of an auditor. We discussed rights of an auditor last time. We discussed 10 rights of an auditor. Which are they? From the backbench. You know, I'm starting from here. Backbench, we have very good points, but I'm not reading them. Our doorkeep, our usher. Uh, one right of an auditor. <laughs> yes. To attend the OGM. I want to unrestricted right access to the books of accounts, records, and riches. Right to remuneration. Tell your friends that books are on. We are reading as revise. We can't be right to remuneration. Very correct. Right to receive notices to attend the AGM. Right to Lien, or right of Lien, right to Lien, yes. And we we'll emphasize that he can only hold on Lien that which was privately to its preparation. Perfect. Right to identity, to be identified by the client for expenses incurred or less suffered during the post exercise, which he ought not to have incurred. Perfect. Another point. Right to speak in the agent through the chair. I don't know. 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 Right to seek legal and technical expertise. Then the regress is coming under the rights during removal. Can we call the five rights during removal? Right to seek legal address, right? Another right during removal is yes, right during removal of an auditor. Right, right during removal. Receive notices. To speak at the AGM discussing his removal, to read the representations, and to seek legal redress. Ah, perfect. Seek legal uh, right to receive notices. I'm sure it's you can't forget, but duties sometimes they are troublesome. <laughs> duties sometimes they don't pro like the rights. Which duty can you recall? Apart from duty to write a report, <laughs> apart from duty to write a report containing the editor's opinion, you have to place an amendment 
Yeah, I'm writing, at least we are utilizing what I said. If you can't convince them, confuse them. Yes, at least we are using that so well. But no, do not leave a question and answer it. Write anything. Yes, in auditing language, in English, and you leave it there. And you leave it there. Yes. Qualify or disqualify the word? Need to qualify or disqualify that is still under digital right and thought for one point. So needed to capture the contents of the survey and share it in his report. Needed to call for information relating to collaterals. Needed to avail working papers to assist in structural investigations. And number five, needed to certify financial statements, including prospectus, including a question. Point number one. Point number one here. If an auditor introduces that mm -hmm. that report becomes his audit report becomes qualified. It's, it's, it's a good uh, input. Eh? It does not mean it's qualified. Because eh? let me uh, mention what Warren and Tori is saying with regard to point number one that she feels by the author introducing a disclaimer, then his report becomes qualified. The disclaimer we're discussing here does not make the auditor's report to become qualified. But the disclaimer in the qualification matrix will make the auditor's report to be qualified. In qualification matrix, we talk of uh, auditors qualifying the report because of either limitations on scope or disagreements. In those two cases, we may either have an adverse or a disclaimer of evidence. A disclaimer of report. Let me show you how we go about it. We have four types of opinions. I want to explain where the disclaimer is coming in because your point is well, that we could have an issue of limitations on scope. Limitations on scope, that the evidence is missing. Other instances are disagreement. We have other evidence, but we disagree. If what is missing is very material, is very significant. We give and uh, a disclaimer of opinion. We disclaim our opinion. But if it's a matter of disagreement, we just issue an adverse opinion. If what is missing or the disagreement is not uh, so material, we issue qualified. Qualified opinion or except for. Except for opinion. So I uh, understand this disclaimer aspect. This will come later. This will come later. So this disclaimer is the one we've mentioned in the case of head rebellion versus hair and partners, trying to extinguish from liabilities, distancing from any liabilities that may arise. Who you are to quit? We are to quit. Thanks for that input. Thanks for that input. All right. Unless there is a question, there's one thing I would like us to discuss. But the beauty of it, you already have it in your notes somewhere. But I never explained. You have it somewhere? What is true and fair? Definition. We've really, really used this. Definition of true and fair view. Why are we defining it? Companies act is silent on what true and fair is. It's so silent on what true and fair is. It leaves it to the accountants to define what it is. It does not define for us. So we define it using two ways or two methods. Number one, the literal, the literal meanings. The literal meanings. And number two, the assertion methodology. The assertion methodology. So the literal meanings. Literal meanings, Kingereza English defines truth as not false. Is this a definition or opposite? Truth is not false. You know, in, in account, there are some things we go against English. 
So you know we always say there is plural for money. Do you have plural for money in English? Are they monies? <laughs> Bring it in accounts, we call them money. So truth is should be is truth is not false or verifiable. Truth is verifiable. Truth is not false or I hope you're not confuse English. Truth is not false. It's something verifiable. That's what I mean. It's not false, or it is something which is verifiable. If it's verifiable, then it's the truth. But if, for instance, you said you've paid some fees and you're able to produce a, res uh, a receipt, that's the truth because it's verifiable. So truth is verifiable. Truth is not false. That's what you're saying. It's uh, uh, not false, then it is uh, very clear. So this note does not extend uh, to all uh, uh, verifiable. Full stop. Full stop. Then we got about fairness. You know, fairness is a perception. Yeah, fairness is about, but we may perceive fairness or not. It's about equity. Equity is fairness. You may perceive equity or inequity. Sometimes, some of them may make a statement and we feel that they were fair enough. But some people amongst us may feel that was not fair because it's about perception. So financial statements are considered to be fair if they are not biased. Not biased. Again, if they have been prepared as per the relevant, relevant professional, professional pronouncements, professional pronouncements, e.g. IAS, Companies Act, Companies Act, IFRS, ETC. That if the financial statements have been prepared as per this professional pronouncement, then they will be considered to be fair. Plus, they are also fair if they meet, if they meet their expectations, expectations of the users. That's why I said, it's about perception. And that's why even as an auditor, sometimes you ask, why are you auditing? Now we want to submit this to the bank, they give us a loan. So you audit it in that manner, that it's to be available to the bank to give some loan. So when you're through, you need to check, is it meeting the expectations of the bank? If it is, then they are fair. So truth is very fair, but it's not false. Fairness, if it meets your expectations as an intended user, if the records have been prepared as per the relevant professional pronouncements, they are considered to be fair. If they are not biased, if they are objective, then they are fair. Let's use the assertion methodology, and that's where my point is now. Assertion. Assertion methodology. Methodology. A question that rarely does it miss in every other sitting every other sitting about assertions. Although we still discuss them, and uh, it's a 500 audit evidence, but it's good to have a first point as we define this. So I can say assertions are declarations. Assertions are Declarations made by the management. Declarations made by the management when preparing financial statements. Full stop. They could be implied or express, implied or express. 
then we say assertions relating to balance sheet balance sheet items are discussed using the acronym DAL, i.e. I need to find that question in the past papers. Before you write what you're writing there. Because a very common question. It's a very common question. So we are talking of the DAV acronym, disclosure, ownership, valuation, and existence. Valuation and existence. Yes, as if I was in on a Kanahara the very first, first questions. Yes, in December 2021, December 2021, question number 4A. Deck 2021, question number 4A. I know it's even in the recent papers, but like I'm not able to trace very fast. And they're asking, state the key financial statement assertions applicable to tangible and current assets. So you're only supposed to know that an uncurrent asset is a B-sheet item. Then these are the assertions. This time they give from, they usually give eight. They usually give eight. So it's that important that you get right these assertions. It's very important. They are so often, they are so often, they test so often. They test so often. So what we mean by assertions as explained, uh, declarations made by the management when they're preparing financial statements. And these are assertions relating to B-sheet items. These are assertions relating to uh, B-sheet items. We'll discuss others later. That if you find the client having the coded motor vehicle, motor vehicle in the B-sheet, and it is reading 4.2 million, unless otherwise, unless otherwise, the assumption to you as an auditor is, that this motor vehicle existed as at the B sheet date, unless otherwise, because what are assets? Items of value belonging to the client. So if it's an asset, then it must be in existence. That's why we are saying some of these assertions are implied, unless otherwise stated, which could be expressed. The assumption will be it exists. Otherwise, as an auditor, if you cannot trace this motor vehicle, it's, it's a gray area. Why is it appearing in the assets? The assumption again would be that this motor vehicle is properly valued. You know, IAS, International Account Standard Number 16, we discussed it, PPE, Property Plant Equipment, Norman Shelley, required that assets are recorded at historical cost, net of accumulated depreciation. And this otherwise, that's what has been done. Ownership, an asset is an item of value belonging to the client. Unless otherwise, it should be belonging to the client. We can confirm this through the logbook. Disclosure that there is completeness, no omission. All the motor vehicles have been recorded. These are the assertions we test. Now, how does it come to define true and fair? If, as an outside, you are able to confirm these assertions relating to a bullshit item, then the financial statements portrays true and fair. That's how we define. That's how we define. 
So we proceed to say, if an auditor is able to confirm the above assertions, then it means then it means that the financial statements that the financial statements portrays a true and fair view. If an author is able to confirm the above assertions, then it means that the financial statements portrays a true and fair view. But if you try to confirm existence, it's not, it's non-existent, it's a ghost asset. If you try to confirm variation, proper variation has not been done. It's either overstated, maybe depreciation has not been accounted for. Ownership, they cannot confirm about the rights to this asset. You can never report that they portray true and fair. That's how we define using the assertion methodology, using the assertion uh, methodology. Any question? We test this even at advanced level. There is a thing that it was question number one. They are asking with the assertions we need to test with regard to a molding, molding machine. You only need to know that a machine is an asset. So these are the assertions you're testing. Then they were asking us, how do you test those assertions? How do you test existence? You do physical verification. How do you test valuation? You recalculate. Take the asset to compute the position and check how it has been posted. How can you confirm ownership? You can check through the invoices, invoices, and even insurance, because you cannot insure what is not yours. You check insurance, you can always confirm that. Disclosure, here you seek management representation later. Okay, I'm taking you so very fast. We'll discuss management representation later. We require ISA 580. ISA 580 requires that as an auditor, you seek a representation letter on matters disclosure and completeness. We'll get that uh, to discuss that as a subtopic. So those are how many marks? I think they're around 12 marks. And then other questions about uh, the assets. So, so it's a very sensitive area. Uh, you need to get right. Any question, any suggestion? Course, that's what you're supposed to cover uh, for today. That's what you're supposed to cover. Dave, uh, we meet on Saturday for, for the first cut. At least every other month we test ourselves. Yeah, uh, we, we are not even done with the second topic, so you have very little to, to, to read. So if there's something important, if you find yourself going for an exam without having attempted a serious cut, you've already hung the rope here, you want to jump and commit suicide. You're committing suicide. How now? How now? That you're going to test yourself for the first time with the national paper. Hey, that's, that's not good. That's not good. Even if we have, we have a lot of time limitation, you need to test yourself. Other times, other times maybe you find that like the, the last part I usually don't mark, but it sends some signals. Sometimes we sit for a cut, but some people are left behind doing some meetings, meetings between themselves. In Ajita Mkutano, after a cut, it has not even been marked. Like in Ajita Mkutano, now there is trouble. And there's no one good thing like being able to identify a problem. I usually lecture problem solving techniques. We always start with problem definition. If you get it right, ah, you're able to solve it. Able to solve it. I know we'll be having a palace here. Yeah, training. How many papers do you sit per day in an in Kasnev? Like two. Let's 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 flex on let's strengthen our shock absorbers early enough. So that in April uh, we are good to go. So for physical, you'll see it here. Online, you'll attempt scan and send me. Up to send me a come print and mark. So 
Yeah, online family, make sure you don't copy. I always tell them, don't copy. You can confirm, but not copy pasting. <laughs> yeah. So between now, uh, uh, internalize on uh, types of audits, especially. Yeah, I need to add another paper here. Types of audits. You find these in the past papers. After I not come up with my own questions, I need to put them from the past paper because that's what Casnot does. So prepare yourself. Uh, at least you start early now. Every other time you sit for an exam and you're not ready, you always say, I wish I started revising early. This paper is not so tough. So it's now. The time is now to revise. Let's say the grace. None of the grace. Oh, Jesus Christ. And the love of God. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. With us now and forevermore. Amen. If then always, uh, always remember to pray for yourself. Let the foundation of uh, our academics be based on God. Yes, so that uh, 